cut here and go to the presentation. So have a good trip back home, John. I'll, I'll stay with you as long as I can. Okay, make you sure you use an airplane when you come home, though, so it's a long <laughs> way from Boston. All right. So you've already seen some of the stuff we're doing here on the virtual TED that we've done. So I'll just, in my seven minutes that I have left, cut to the chase. We have a lot to cover. So first of all, what is Second Life? Second Life is... Basically, it's a multi-user platform for about four years old. It comprises uh, close to 5,000 network servers, open source client for Windows, Macintosh, and Linux. And it's, uh, currently there are four and a third million created accounts free to join. That's up from a million less than five months ago. It's serving up the equivalent of over 360 square kilometers. That's over six Manhattans of user-created, user-shared, inhabited, three-dimensional virtual reality. And the whole world of bits and atoms, this one is all bits. And uh, much like the real world, it's still far from a perfect place. It is not a game, although um, you know, people create, play games, uh, among many other activities, there's no objective point scoring winning in Second Life, but people do create and play games. It's actually two simultaneous, sometimes overlapping social networks. People who know each other in the real world, professionally, personally, meet in Second Life, but there's also an emergent social network of the created identities or avatars within Second Life. Often they don't even know anything about the, each other's real life, but their rich relationships are built anyway. You can consider the evolving interface to the internet from back when I started using it, green phosphors on a black screen into hypertext, into organization and imagery, into what you consider a, a website of today. But imagine the hybrid three-dimensional um, interface into a website. So you go to a website and you just dive on in and you can start interacting with the company's products, representatives, customers, and so on. So a lot of people think that really this is where this kind of uh, experience is going. The economy of Second Life is real in that whatever you create, you own, and you can sell it, your services, you can sell your land, um, and it's based on a currency that is exchangeable on an open free market exchange with real world currencies. As a platform, this place is built entirely by its users. It's been called the world's largest collaborative art project. And when you use the in-world design and programming tools, people come together not only to create their world around them, but to create the memories that they share of having inhabited the same space at the same time and the same experience. It's a virtual world, it's a place, it's a very large place, and you're going to find familiar sites where people have recreated cities, towns, and places. But you're also going to find places that emerge solely from the imagination, places that uh, are fantastic or themselves are generated through genetic architectural programs. Over 100 universities and colleges are teaching in Second Life or about Second Life this semester, ranging from the arts, social sciences, politics, sociology, psychology, engineering, uh, the sciences. But there's also a in-world educational system where people gather where they're learning the scripting language that's behind Second Life. Uh, and so the educational system also incorporates what's going on in the world itself. It's a rich place for science, education, demonstration, and research because, again, everything's connectable, programmable, creatable, and connects to the outside world. Here's an example of NOAA's uh, meteorological uh, exhibit. Here is the International Space Science Museum created in Second Life entirely by volunteers. And you're seeing an increasing presence of companies coming in not just to ride the buzz and not just to lob their uh, logo in over the uh, transom, but are using it for research and to start staking their ground into uh, what really may be the interface of the future. But brands are also emerging within Second Life in and for Second Life itself. For instance, fashion is a, is a big industry in Second Life, and a lot of brands are being developed. People experiment with style in Second Life and then carry those experiments and that uh, willingness to experiment out into the real world. There's a thriving arts community, whether it's musical arts, performance arts, dr uh, dramatic arts, uh, the visual arts. There are galleries and museums where people either attend or buy and sell art, uh, sometimes art imported from the real world, sometimes created entirely in Second Life for their virtual homes and offices. 
and machinima is a new genre uh, where you can start taking cinematic uh, advantage of this. The political process, you're starting to see protests uh, in Second Life, political discussions. And here's John himself uh, you know, recreating something from 1970. You were there then, weren't you, John? And um, let me just rewind that again because uh, I missed the clip. We're also seeing real policymakers and, and politicians within Second Life, um, and we had the the first entry of uh, Congress uh, last month. We also had. Um, Grassroots political campaigns from 2008 starting to find their way into Second Life. Um, we're also seeing, for instance, yeah, here's Congressman George Miller, John Gage again, uh, looking at an avatar design for their friend Nancy. And where there's entertainment, where there's politics, media is going to follow. And it's not just, and Lord knows there's a lot of attention being paid up from the external media on Second Life, but there's an internal uh, journalistic practice that's developing, covering from within Second Life for it. So how do you create the avatar of your dreams, whether it's this, this, this? I mean, it really is limited by your imagination. The first thing you know, need to do is get high-speed internet and good graphics capability. But this is TED, so you're probably all right with all that. Go to secondlife.com, find the system requirements recommendations. You sign up. There's a list of last names, which is uh, they rotate every uh, few weeks. You, choose, you get to choose whatever first name. People choose fanciful names. People choose names that are... Uh, more like what they have in real life. Once you have your name, once you sign up for your free account, uh, you download the Second Life application, and then you log into it. Once you've logged in, you basically start out the world with your cohort of uh, newborns on an island where you go through the paces. There is a bit of a learning curve to get it all done. One of the first things that you do is start editing your appearances. You've chosen a look from one of the stock looks that you get, there are about a dozen stock looks, but there's a rich editing system within Second Life, so you can start to uh, use sliders, use uh, various tabs to reconstruct yourself from the ground up. You know, here you can just fine tune the details of your eyes, your skin, your hair, your uh, body mass, um, or you can you know, become an animal, you can become a robot, you're not limited to the human form as you saw on the earlier one. So this guy's ready to go out in the world. On the other hand, because <coughs> there's this whole economy in Second Life, as I said, fashion's a big thing. All this user-created content is for sale. So you get to go out and try on all sorts of things. And as I said, people experiment with style in Second Life as a social process and then take that to the real world. So this guy's decided to try on a new head of hair, and out he goes. Okay, once you're in Second Life, the natural thing is to get together. There are groups formed around politics, religion, uh, profession, country of origin, company you work for, people want to get together, and they do. They get together for all sorts of things. I'm not going to go to the, a lot of the places that you get to in Second Life, but they get together to do things like learn and share. Here's an interface. This is what virtual worlds looked like in 1986 with Lucas's Habitat. A lot of the same functionality was in it, but we've uh, evolved the interface quite a bit. Out of those six Manhattans worth of land, you're going to want to get your own land so you can start building things, so you can start homesteading it, so you can customize your space, so you can invite people over uh, and build your home. Here we're building the Dutch Ministry of the Environment, at least part of it. And then once you have your place, once you have your avatar, you're ready to go out in the world. And the search system allows you to find places to go because of the people there, the things that you can buy there. You know, whatever takes you around the world, you can get there. Um, and there's no problem with adjacency. You just teleport and you're there. The place I wanted to go is this virtual Monterey that we've been building and uh, uh, that we hope to be a, uh, essentially a permanent Second Life venue for the TED community, the extended TED community, so that everybody can uh, come to it. So that's it. Are there any questions before uh, I have to chase you all out of here? How do we get to the virtual Monterey?